Hi, I'm Donna Stark, the District 7 Program Quality Director. The International Speech and Speech Evaluation Contest is in full swing here in District 7 and will culminate with the District Contest at the Spring Conference on May 6th. Contest season is exciting and there are lots of roles to fill. Speakers, timers, ballot counters, and contest judges are all important components of successful speech contests. Now, my experience has been that people are sometimes more eager to pitch in and help as a timer or as a ballot counter than they are to be a contest judge. And I get that. I used to be hesitant, too. But like everything we do in Toastmasters, there are resources to help us learn. Last summer, I had the opportunity to serve as a contest judge at the International Speech Contest semifinals. My goal tonight is to equip you with the tools to confidently take on the role of contest judge. Why do we have speech contests? They provide an opportunity for Toastmasters to practice speaking in a competitive setting. And any time we step outside of our comfort zone, we experience growth. They provide an interesting educational, educational program for our members and for the public. They provide an opportunity to learn by observing proficient speakers. And most importantly, contests are fun. They're a change of pace, an opportunity to network and celebrate Toastmasters who want to participate in the competitive speaking experience. Judges do have an obligation. They have an obligation to contestants who both expect and deserve fairness and impartiality. Judges have an obligation to Toastmasters International to uphold the organization's reputation for excellence. Judges have an obligation to the audience. An appearance of unfair or biased judging can discourage audience members from attending or even from participating in other contexts. And of course, judges have an obligation to themselves. Integrity matters. And part of the Toastmasters program is wanting to do the best we can with any task we have. Let's take a look at the characteristic of good judges. Accuracy. Good judges complete the judging form correctly. A sense of fairness. Good judges are totally impartial and don't allow friendship, affiliation, age, gender, race, national origin, profession, all that list of things, and even disapproval of speech topics to interfere with their decision. Contest judges can be trusted. Good judges realize that all contest participants have entrusted them with the responsibility of selecting the best speaker as the winner. They're committed to make the correct decision. Good judges are knowledgeable. They'll know the current contest rules, and they don't make exceptions. They're familiar with the judging form and know how to judge properly. And good judges are good listeners. They pay attention. They listen carefully to each speaker, and they don't become distracted. Who qualifies to be a judge? Well, to judge at the club level, you need to be a paid member of either your club or another club. Some clubs will arrange to bring in judges from outside clubs to help judge their club contests. To be a judge at the area, division, or district level, one needs to be a paid member for at least six months and completed a minimum of six speeches from the competent communication manual. Judges and other contest functionaries obviously cannot compete in the contest at which they are serving. Now that's not to say at an area contest where we often have combined events that if someone is participating in the international speech contest and they aren't competing in the speech evaluation contest, they can compete in one and judge for the other. Just because they're occurring at the same time does not make them the same contest. Something else to keep in mind, if you're competing and you volunteer to judge beyond the club level, let's say 
you're visiting another area and you say, sure, I'll, I'll help you out and judge, you then forfeit your eligibility to compete. So if you're competing in a speech contest, I would recommend you not participate in judging beyond the club level. Now let's talk about the difference between judging and evaluating. A judge's job is to select a winner, to determine which speaker has given the best speech on that day. Evaluators appraise a speech and measure the speaker's presentation against the purpose and then provide feedback about strengths and suggestions for improvements. Judges' decisions are to remain confidential. Don't discuss your decision. Even if contestants or other Toastmasters ask, and they have, it's not appropriate for a judge to provide feedback about a speaker's performance or how they could improve next time. I've seen this happen, and it can be awkward to tell someone, I'm sorry, I can't tell you that, but that's exactly what you need to say. I'm sorry, I can't discuss that, and perhaps next time you'll want to arrange for an evaluator to give you that kind of feedback. There are some potential barriers to objectivity. Some of the things to be aware of are speaker position or speaker order. When we're presented with a list or a series, we will often recall the end of the list first because it's the most recent thing that was added to our short-term memory. People may also remember the beginning of a list better than the middle because it serves as a reference point. Judges need to compensate for this effect by paying close attention to every contestant. Champion for the underdog. It's human nature to believe that underdogs put forth more effort than an advantaged or more powerful opponent and thus are more deserving of success. As judges, we must use only the criteria on the judge's guiding ballot to select our winners. The halo effect. This is an inclination to admire all of a person's work because of one admirable quality. Judges need to focus on how each contestant performs using the criteria on the judge's guide and ballot. For example, if a contestant happens to be a speech teacher, this does not automatically mean that their contest presentation will be the best. Likewise, a dynamic delivery style does not necessarily signify compelling content. Good use of vocabulary does not automatically indicate good use of gestures or vocal varieties. All of these are separate aspects of the judge's guide and ballot. Reverse halo effect. On the flip side, resist downgrading a score in one area because you're not happy with the contestant's performance in another area. A speaker may use poor grammar, yet have a very well-organized speech. Judge each portion of the ballot separately. Second time around, it's not unusual for us to see the same contestant compete at different contest levels during the same cycle or compete from one year to the next. It's important to not compare an individual's current performance or delivery to previous presentations. Remember, the primary responsibility of a judge is to choose the best speaker at the current contest. Not the norm. For example, in some geographic areas, it's typical for a contestant to stand behind a lectern when speaking. Judges who are accustomed to this behavior may harshly judge a contestant who does not do so. It has to do with the customs in different areas, but those customs may not relate directly to the judging standards. Prejudices and personal preference, and we all have them. Judging is a subjective process that we try to make as objective as we can. Every judge comes to the table with their individual opinions, their likes and their dislikes, and it's almost impossible for anyone to be totally objective. And that's why we use panels of judges to restrict, restrict the potential effect of any single judge's bias. And remember, whether you agree with a speaker's topic, premise, or opinion, that's irrelevant. You base your ballot on the criteria. It's important to know the rules. 
This is the current contest rulebook that you see. And they are the only rules that apply. They're updated periodically, so make sure you have the most current version. As stories and memories about contests circulate, they may transform into common knowledge rules, or as I like to call them, urban legends. They aren't necessarily part of the official rule book, but people have come to accept them as such. You can prevent misconceptions by separating fact and fiction. For instance, did you know contestants can use props, including any sort of electronic device, as long as they coordinate with the contest chair prior to the contest, and of course abide by any venue restrictions, and it's something they can set up and remove during the minute of silence. Another example is the international speech contest used to be known as the serious speech contests. And some toasters, Toastmasters may feel that humor is more appropriate for the humorous speech contest and shouldn't be prominently featured in an international speech. It's not only okay to use humor in the international speech contest, if you pay attention to some of the recent winners, it's been an important part of those winning speeches. Here's the judge's guide and ballot. You'll notice there are two sections to the form. The top portion is a guide that judges use to help them select a winner. The bottom portion is the official ballot. I recommend you sign it first before you do anything else. To be, to be considered a complete ballot, a judge must select a first, second, and third place contestant, assuming that there are three or more contestants in the contest. If you are selected as a tie-breaking judge, you must rank or place all of the contestants. Did I mention sign your ballot? The ballot cannot be counted if it is incomplete or unreadable. It helps to avoid bias by not filling out the guide during the speech. Instead, take notes and record what the speaker did well or poorly and use these notes to enter point values for each category on the guide after the speech is over. This helps a judge focus on the speech instead of the guide and helps a judge from being overly influenced by one particular category. Use the point values suggested for each rating. And you can use the full range of point values. There's a rating of excellent, very good, good, and fair. And you will notice that, except for the excellent range, there's a five-point range for good and a five-point range for very good. The phrase that comes to mind is, several speeches may be very good and some may be more very good than others. Use the full range of points allotted to you. Some judges use a system of pluses and minuses to rate speakers as they compete and assign the points afterwards. When filling out the guides, I recommend that you put the first speaker on the right-hand side of the ballot where it says number 10. And then you can fold the ballot under and won't be distracted by the point total that you gave the previous speaker. This helps from being influenced by ratings that you've seen before and helps you evaluate each speaker independently. Oh, and did I mention sign your ballot? We stress this because it has happened. And it is really unfortunate when after you give a ballot to the ballot counter, it can't be used and it can't be counted. It's very important that each judge's ballot counts. Tear off the bottom, give it to the ballot counter, and remember, your results are secret. You can't give feedback, and you'll want to, as I say, destroy the evidence by disposing of the top part of the ballot away from the contest venue. It really should not be shared with anyone. Now let's take a look at the judging categories. It's grouped into three sections, content, delivery, and language. Notice there is not a section for timing. That is not the judge's job. That is the timer's job. Judges are not permitted to time the speech, 
and you are not to consider the possibility of undertime or overtime when judging a contestant's speech. Let's look more closely at each of the three areas. Content. Now this accounts for 50% of the available points. Speech development, effectiveness, and value. The areas to consider under speech development. Did the speech have a clearly defined opening, body, and conclusion? Were the speaker's ideas presented in an easy-to-follow logical sequence? Did the speaker use effective transitions when moving from one concept to the next? Was the speech purpose clear? Speech effectiveness. How did the audience react? Did the audience react? Was the subject relevant to the audience? Did the speaker present their subject clearly? Could you determine the speech purpose? Was it to entertain, inform, persuade, or inspire? Did the speaker achieve his or her purpose? And the speech value. Did the speaker have a substantive, logical, clearly defined message? Were the speaker's thoughts original? Was the speech in good taste? Again, remember that whether you agree with the speaker's topic or premise is not one of the criterion. The next section of the judge's guide is delivery. And this accounts for 30% of the possible point value. How is the content presented? Areas to consider are the physical. The speaker's appearance, body language, was it appropriate and purposeful? How well did they use their speaking area? Their voice, what we Toastmasters call vocal variety. The flexibility in volume. Their use of modulation to show emotion. Was their volume adequate? Could you hear them? And their enunciation of words. And their manner, their stage presence. Were they confident and enthusiastic? Did they show concern for the audience? The last section of the ballot has to do with language, and this is 20% of the available point total. It reflects word choice and grammatical skill. Areas to consider are appropriateness. Does the speaker's choice of words fit the speech, the audience, and the occasion? Did the words they used promote understanding of the message as the speaker intended? Correctness. This is the grammarian section of the guide. Deals with grammar, pronunciation, word selection. Did the language reflect study and preparation? Was the word choice effective? I want to touch on protests and disqualifications just a little bit. Protests, fortunately, are rare, and they're limited to eligibility of the speaker and originality of their presentation. Protests can be lodged only by voting judges and contestants. They cannot be lodged by audience members or others. Only judges and contestants can lodge a protest. Protests need to be made to the contest chair and or the chief judge before the announcement of the contest results. Once the winners and alternates have been announced, the opportunity to protest is over. The rules state that contestants must prepare their own speeches and each must be substantially original. What does substantially original mean? This is something that actually has changed over time in the rule book. First, contestants will certify by signing the speaker's certification of eligibility and originality that they prepared their speech. But there's also a definition in the rule book that states 25% or less of the speech may be devoted to quoting, paraphrasing, or referencing another person's content. And any quoted, paraphrased, or referenced content must be identified as such during the presentation and credit given to whomever said it originally if it's known. One example that I have seen in the uh, last five years or so was a situation where those jokes that get circulated on the internet, somebody took one and very cleverly 
personalized it. It was a very, very funny story, which would have been great for the humorous stroll in a meeting, but it did not meet the standards for originality in the contest, and it was protested by, by another contestant. Now, before a contestant can be disqualified on the basis of originality, they're given an opportunity to respond to the voting judges and present where their speech came from and information that the judges will need to know. A majority of voting judges must concur in the decision to disqualify. Another area where a contestant can be disqualified is by the contest chair. If a contestant is not determined to be eligible. Uh, membership dues is probably the most frequent item that I can think of that would disqualify someone from competing. They need to be a member of good standing in a club of good standing and the contest share should confirm that before the contest starts. Other situations that have come up is someone trying to compete in multiple areas. We can belong to as many clubs as we want. And we can compete at the club level in every club for which we're a member. But to move on, we need to choose a single club to represent at the area contest. Once somebody competes in one area, they are no longer eligible to compete in any other area contest that season. Judges' decisions are final. There is no appeal process after the contest is over. Resources that I recommend for judges, the first is the contest rulebook. It's available for download from the TI website. Personally, I print it on a larger paper with a large font, highlight the things that I want to make sure I remember and have it on hand. There are also videos on the Toastmasters International website. If you go to the website and do the search function for contest videos, uh, they're instructional, they're brief, and can provide some good background information if you want to follow up with questions. And then finally, your chief judge. That is why they're there. If you have any questions when you are serving as a contest judge, make sure that you ask those of the chief judge before the contest starts. These tips and resources should help you become a competent and confident speech contest judge. And then you too can judge at the international contest level. Do we have any questions? Donna, something that was new last year for us, and I thought you might want to touch on it, is there is now a place on the TI website where people can check eligibility. That's true. And that is something that our district contest chair used to verify every single contestant at the contest uh, district level. But it's something that especially area and division directors may want to use as well. You can go to this spot on the website, enter a member's ID number, and it will come back and determine whether or not their dues have been paid and that the club is also in good standing. It's unfortunate if somebody pays their dues to the treasurer and the treasurer then doesn't pay them with Toastmasters International. And with the, we no longer have a grace period. Once dues are due, they are due. Our division contests start on April 1st. Anybody paid up right now is paid through March 31st. So it will be very important for clubs to make sure they get their dues collected and submitted prior to the deadline, especially for those who have, who can make it to the division level. And they have a division that could be holding a contest on April 1st. Okay, David has a question. Okay, we delivered, let me, okay. We allowed two contestants who had not completed at least six CC projects at the club level for the experience but only one had completed those six project requirements but came in third. Does the third place winner go on to the area? 
I'm going to go to a strict interpretation of the rules. First of all, contest, or clubs can choose their contestants in any manner that they choose. Uh, rock, paper, scissors, a show of hands who's interested, that's all acceptable. It may not be best practice, but it is according to the rules for a club to determine who to move on to the area contest in that way. However, if the club holds a contest, they are supposed to abide by the contest rules. So technically, uh, the only folks who could compete would be those who met the eligibility criteria. And the International Speech Contest is the only contest that has that six speech minimum. So I can understand wanting to give somebody the experience, just be aware that only those who met the eligibility criteria could move on. So if the one eligible contestant's place third, that's they're the ones who can move on. When you get to the area level, the desire is to have equal representation from the clubs in the area at a minimum. If you can bring in outside judges, that's great. At the division and the district level and beyond, you can't have a judge from somebody who's in the same club as one of the contestants. So it, it gets to be a little bit more of a challenge the further in the contest that you go to find judges that meet the criteria needed to be able to judge at that contest. So anything that folks on this call are willing to do is very much appreciated. So Donna, if I say, for instance, I am the, a judge at an area contest, say it's area 63, 64, 65, they have their contest, and I judge that contest, and then they have their division contest, can I judge at that one also? Assuming that you are not in any club with any of the contestants at the division level, then yes, you could. Okay. Looks like Robert has a question. Go ahead, Robert. Uh. Or was your hand up because you wanted to be on the judges list? Damn, come on. We can hear you. Oh, you can. Okay. Uh, no, I, yeah, I wanted to be on the judges list. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any, any other questions? Was this helpful to people? To go through this, kind of re I'm sure some of you have been through judges training before. Let's see. Go ahead, Cami. You need to unmute yourself. Okay. I uh, yeah, just one quick question. I wonder how it works. So the there are multiple judges. I I was just in my first contest today, and I I believe there were three judges. Maybe I wasn't paying a ton of attention. I know there was definitely more than one. So do each does each person cast their ballot and then they they left the room and they conferred? I guess I was just kind of curious what happens when the judges leave the room and how they arrive at their final answer. Typically what will happen is that ballot counters come around and collect the ballots and they will take them away with typically the chief judge and count those ballots. The judges don't go away and discuss. So the information from their ballots is taken and recorded. First place winners are given three points, I believe. Second place on the ballot is awarded two and third place is awarded one. That's all recorded on an information sheet and the point total is counted up and whoever ends up with the most points is declared the winner. Okay, so the judges, they're filling out the top part, which is a point value, and then based on, they, let's say they evaluated, evaluated three people, they would put one, two, three based on the point values, 
And then when the ballot counters, do the ballot the ballot counters have both both pieces of information, the point values and the no. first second? The, oh, they don't. The top piece is something that the judges keep, and I encourage them to dispose of them away from the contest venue. Um, sometimes okay. I've jokingly said, put a little salt and pepper on it, eat it, chew it, whatever it takes to, <laughs> okay. so that nobody could ever see that. Okay, um, so it's really the just official ballot different. is just the bottom part. And okay. they write down the three names, first place, second place, third place, and then the ballot counters assign the points to each I speaker. See. I got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Just a little fun fact. At the International Speech Contest, at well, at the World... Uh, the International Speech Contest at the International Convention, the winner is the world champion of public speaking, which means it's totally changed their life, like our own um, Ryan Avery. And there are 15 judges. I, I've judged too, but I got to count ballots, and, and that was kind of interesting because there were about four of us back there counting on the ballots. So you know when somebody's number one that everybody thought that that's where they belonged. There are recommended numbers of judges for the club level and I believe it's five. I know of a lot of clubs where they can't pull together that many people. So it's five or as many as practical. I always go for an odd number. But definitely more than one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Donna, did you, I noticed uh, something that I've seen happen at numerous contests and that has to do with the tie break, the judge's tie breaking ballot. Mm -hmm. And that person is supposed to be secret. We make yeah. a we make kind of a, a joke out of how judges are supposed to be secret. We don't say, "Thank you, Donna, for being a judge tonight." We never do that. We never say, "Well, all the judges stand up so we can thank you." You you don't do that, and yet the judges wave these white pieces of paper envelopes, yes, in, in the air, which is <laughs> kind of funny. But truly, the tie-breaking judge is to be known only to the chief judge. So you That's true. You really try to be discreet with that one. The tie-breaking judge will not attend the pre-contest judge's briefing. Uh, and their ballot is looked at only in the event of the tie. So they give their ballot directly to the chief judge, and it may or may not ever be used. Yes. And in that case, they have, they have to rank everybody. So yes. if there were seven contestants, then they rank every single one of them. And if the tie yeah. is between you know, Donna and David, then you look and see which one was ranked highest by the tie-breaking judge, and that's the one that wins. Mm -hmm. oh. It's interesting. I find the whole contest process very interesting. As I mentioned, I was very hesitant to serve as a judge, but it's it's something you learn, just like everything else within Toastmasters. And the whole concept of trying to take something that truly is very subjective and make it as objective a process as possible and give some firm guidelines about this is what a judge should look for, I find that very interesting, especially when it comes to somebody who's a very dynamic presenter. If you look at the ballot, 50% of the points has to do with how the speech is organized, not necessarily with somebody's stage presence or the words that they use. 